Hey, church, let me encourage you now, if you would, to grab your Bible and join me in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. Matthew, chapter 2, is where we're going to intersect the Christmas story here this morning and for the next few weeks. We're going to be in Matthew 2. We're going to be looking at the visit of the wise man a little bit today and then in the weeks ahead, leading us all the way into Christmas Eve. And as you're turning there, I do want to just highlight for a moment some of the that happened Friday night here in the city of Birmingham. Many of you are aware of this, but the Parker High School Thundering Herd took home the state championship. Yes, that's right. For the first time in the 124 year history of Parker High School, they are state football champions. And I do want you to know, most of the team is not here today because they actually are downtown being honored by the mayor. That's what happens when you win the state championship for the first time in 124 years. You, you get honored by the, the mayor. But as you see those guys uh, for, for the next few weeks, just grab them, hug their neck, congratulate them. And we are going to be serving them a steak dinner. So you may want to be involved in that. We'd love to have your help with that. It's going to be a really fun night. We'll let you know more about that in the weeks ahead. But today, we are going to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 2. I want to start with the first four verses of Matthew chapter 2 as we see this visit from the magi, the wise men, the, the astrologers from the east who come searching for the king that has been born. I want to invite you, if you would, to stand with me as I read from God's word. And all around the room as we're standing, if you're new to Shades, we do this each week at the reading of God's word so that we can be reminded the word of God is the foundation that this church and the church of Jesus Christ is built upon. This is where we make our stand. The unchanging, inerrant, inspired word of God that is living and active and tells us what God says is right and good and true. This is where we turn. Matthew 2, beginning in verse 1, says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Verse 3, but when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was born. And so we'll stop for a moment here this morning, and as we step into the Christmas story here again this morning, let's invite God to bring a fresh word into our hearts, into our lives. Let's ask the Lord to, to come and, and visit with us as we talk about this visit of the wise men. And let's invite him to speak what he knows we need to hear. So would you pray with me to that? And Father, we thank you for this time as we stand before you. We want you to be honored and glorified through our gathering here today, through our time in your word. And so I pray that you would, you would now speak as your word continues to speak, as your word is living and active, stir in us what we need to see and what we need to hear this season here at Christmas. I pray that you would have your way. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that you would be exalted. And I pray that we would not be the same as a result of that which you say. This time is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. And again, I want you to know that over the next couple of weeks and then on Christmas Eve specifically, we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at, at several different perspectives of this 
this encounter that the wise men have first with King Herod here today, but then the, the visit the wise men make to, to Jesus and, and Mary and Joseph and, and the implications of all that that means for our lives, especially here in the midst of the Christmas season. But today I want to I want to draw your attention to two things right here up front. We're going to spend our time together unpacking these two statements. This is all about what we're seeing here in Matthew 2. The first thing I want to draw your attention to in this in this visit from the wise men is the the visit from the wise men actually shows us that the message of Christmas is an invitation of hope for anyone and everyone for all who are searching for hope. That's important. We're going to talk about why that's important, but I just want to say right up front, if you're here this morning, or if you're joining into this message online and you're going, I, I really am walking through some stuff and I, I really do have some things I, I'm not sure what to do with and I don't know how to navigate this situation. And I'm longing for hope, but I'm not really sure what Christmas means to me right now or, or, or what Jesus means to me right now. Please hear this right up front. The Christmas story shows us the invitation that if you are longing for hope, there is hope to be found. If you are longing for hope, there is hope that has been made available to you. And we're going to see that here through the wise men specifically this morning. But the second thing I want to draw your attention to, and we're going to spend a good amount of time on this this morning, is actually what we see in this interaction with King Herod. King Herod is not a, a character in the Christmas story that we often spend a lot of time focusing on. But today, I, I really want to press in a little bit to this interaction between the wise men and King Herod because we see through this interaction that the message of Christmas, please hear this, this is important. The message of Christmas is actually a threat to anyone who wants to be king. The message of Christmas is a threat to anyone who desires to be king, anyone who desires to be in control of their life and their story, anyone who desires to be Lord and master of their life will actually be threatened by what we see here in the story of Christmas. Let's, let's play this out here a little bit. Let's go back to the word of God, Matthew chapter two, and let's see first this really, really good news that the message of Christmas is an invitation to hope for all, for anyone who is searching for hope. Matthew two, verse one. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the scripture says in, of Judea in those days, of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. What does this have to do with, with, with the, the good news that the message of Christmas is an invitation of hope for all who are searching for hope? Well, at this time that, that, that Jesus is born, the people of God, the nation of Israel, who are often referred to as the Jewish people or the nation of the Jews, they are longing for the Messiah. We're going back 2,000 years now, right, to, to, to the time when Jesus was born. The people of God are longing for the Messiah, but they've been longing for the Messiah for hundreds of years at this point. And they've been through generations of struggle and pain. They've been through generations of oppression and, and even bondage in, in, in other nations. They, they've walked through a difficult difficult season and they continue to hold on to this hope that a Messiah one day is going to come and he's going to restore their, their fortunes. He's going he's gonna to lift up the nation of Israel to prominence and power once again. And they are longing for that day, longing for the Messiah to come. But in their longing, they believe that the Messiah was going to come just for them. You see, their hope was a hope for the Jewish people. This was not a hope for the world. 
This was not a hope certainly for the Gentiles. This was a hope just for the Jewish people that they were clinging to and holding on to as they longed for the Messiah to come and rescue them and save them and restore them again to prominence and power on the world stage. Their hope was a hope for the Jews and the Jews alone. And yet, right before we step into the Christmas story, In Matthew's gospel, chapter one, we see this lineage that is laid out that leads us through the generations from King David all the way to Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior that is born. And I I know Matthew 1, for many people, is a a, a passage of Scripture that we just kind of fly right through. It's like, what are all these names about? These are weird names, and why are they in the Bible? And what do they have to do with with, with the the story of Christmas? And what do they have to do with the, the message of Jesus? But this lineage is important. Because this lineage shows us the the historical significance, especially for the Jewish people, of, of, of where the Messiah would come from. And at the same time, show us, if we're looking, that this message of hope that is the Messiah is actually a message, an invitation of hope for anyone, not just the Jewish people, who are searching for hope. Here, I want to give you an example of this in Matthew chapter one, verse five and six. Matthew chapter one, verses five and six. Again, this is the lineage of Jesus. Again, many times we we look at this list of names and we go, I don't understand these names. These are strange names. Let's just fly right through it and let's let's get to the the important stuff of the Christmas story. But, But when we step into this lineage, we actually see these names are all here for a reason. And in verse five specifically, we see some strange names that have some significant implications. I just want to pick it up right where the verse starts. It's talking about this lineage, and it says, And Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. Now, you may have heard of David, the king. You may have heard of Jesse, David's father, and you may be familiar a little bit with, with Ruth or Boaz or Rahab, but what in the world are these names here for? And why turn to the lineage of Jesus to see that this message of hope is available to all who are searching for hope. Well, let me draw your attention specifically to two of those names. First, Rahab. Rahab is a very interesting name to show up in the lineage of Jesus. You can read her story in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. Rahab is actually a prostitute. Very interesting, right, that a prostitute would show up listed in the lineage of of Jesus. But, But even more than that, Rahab shows up in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament in what is often called the Hall of Fame of Faith because of how bold and audacious her faith was. What did she do? She invited the the spies that Joshua sent into the land to to come and have safekeeping at, at her household so that they could investigate what God was calling them to do to go in and take the land for the people of God. Rahab said, you can come and you can stay here while you are in the land. But but in addition to having a very interesting career path that shows up in the lineage of Jesus, Rahab is actually a Canaanite. That may not mean a whole lot to you and to me, but as a Canaanite, that makes it very clear she is not part of the people of God. She is not part of the the sacred bloodline, if you will. She is from outside of the camp. But here she is, Invited into the family, grafted into the lineage of Jesus, listed as one of the prominent people in the lineage that leads us 
to Jesus. What, what about Ruth? Ruth is the other name I want to draw your attention to here from Matthew chapter one. You can read Ruth's story in the Old Testament in the book of Ruth, named for her. She was a prominent figure uh, among the story of the people of God. But Ruth also was outside of the people of God, outside of the camp. Ruth was a Moabite woman. Rahab's a Canaanite woman. Ruth is a Moabite woman. And the Moabites were a despised people in the eyes of the Jews. They could not stand the Moabites. They looked down upon the Moabites. But, but Ruth marries Boaz and goes with Boaz to Bethlehem, the very town where Jesus would be born. And, and Ruth and Boaz start a new life together where ultimately she becomes the great-grandmother of King David. An incredible, incredible, prominent place in the lineage that leads us to Jesus. Now, why in the world do I draw your attention to this? What in the world does this have to do with the story of Christmas? Well, God is making it clear right there in the lineage of Jesus in some verses of scripture that, that so often we can just fly right past. He is making it clear that this good news of the Messiah is good news for all people who are searching for hope. It's incredible. And this is so important at Christmas that we need to be reminded of this, that the good news of Christmas is not about people cleaning up their life enough to be worthy of receiving this good news or being born from, from a, a certain part of the country or the world so that they're worthy of this good news. It's not about, about being part of the right family so that they can receive this good news. Of course, I am part of the right family. I just want you to know that. W-R-I-G-H-T, yeah. Um, but not everybody is, and, and the good news is, if you're not part of the right family, you're still invited to receive this good news, no matter where you're from, no matter what your story has been, no matter which side of the, the tracks or the mountain you grew up on, this good news is available to all, and God is making it clear in the lineage of Jesus, and then he puts an exclamation point on it right here in Matthew chapter 2 with the visit from the wise men. Why do I say that? Because these visitors come from the east, a faraway land, a foreign pagan Land from a different culture, a different ethnicity, a different background. They're not part of the lineage of faith. They're not part of the household of David. They're not part of the people of God. And so they should not be invited to this party. And yet here they are playing this prominent role in the very story of the arrival of the Messiah so that everyone who reads the Christmas story can see, God wants us to know clearly that this good news is available to all. The wise men come from the east, searching for the king of the Jews, wanting to worship the king who this star is shining upon longing for hope and showing us that anyone who is searching for hope is invited to receive hope through the good news of the Savior that has been born. We're going to talk more about the wise men in the weeks ahead, but with that little setup, I now want to turn our attention for a few moments to the one they first visit, King Herod, in his palace in Jerusalem in Matthew chapter two, we actually see a very different response from the posture that we see among the wise men when Herod finds out why they are there. Look at Matthew chapter two, verse three. It says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Here's that point that I made earlier in the message. 
The message of Christmas is a threat to anyone who desires to be king. Think about what's taking place here in verse three. Historically, we know that when King Herod was placed in power over the region of Judea, Herod became known among the land, among all of Judea. Listen to this. He became known as the king of the Jews. That's the way people refer to Herod, the king of the Jews. And now in his palace, as he is seated on his throne... In walk these men from the east, these foreigners, these outsiders, and they come into the palace and they say, Herod, um, we're here not to visit you. We're here to visit the one who has been born as the king of the Jews. Imagine how that hits Herod, right? And the Bible tells us here uh, in Matthew 2, verse 3, that Herod was troubled by what he heard, and all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. Now, I believe that's one of the greatest understatements in all of the scripture. Herod is ticked off. He is irate at what he's just heard. And when Herod gets irate, all of Jerusalem knows people are about to be killed. That's how Herod responds when he's angry. That's how Herod responds when he feels threatened. In fact, history again tells us Herod was a ruthless tyrant dictator who seemed to take delight in killing anyone who was in his way or viewed as a threat. He killed his own family members. He killed people in his court. He killed people in in his palace. Herod was a ruthless tyrant dictator. And so when Jerusalem hears that some men have showed up from a faraway land, traveling hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles to come to Herod's palace and say, Herod, um, we're actually looking for the real king that's been born, king of the Jews. Everyone knows this is, this is not a good situation and somebody's about to go down. And so Herod immediately begins to devise this plan to use the wise men to help him eradicate the threat. He wants to do away with the threat, the one who has been born called the king of the Jews. He he wants to kill this threat immediately. And so he says to the wise men, you can read this in verses seven and eight, hey, I'm I'm gonna ask you to go find him. That's what the scripture shows us here. Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, listen, that I too may come and worship him. And we all know. Here's this man who feels like his power has been threatened. He doesn't really want to worship the king of the Jews. He wants to eliminate the threat to his power. He wants to eradicate this this threat to his reign and his authority. And so he he says to the wise men, "Go, go find this child and then come back to me and tell me right where he is so I can show up like you guys and worship him. All the while, this is a plan to to eliminate the threat. We're going to look at this more in the weeks ahead, but the wise men, the scripture tells us, they're actually warned in a dream to, to, to go away from their visit with Jesus in Bethlehem back to their home, a different route, so that they can bypass the palace of Herod and stay away from the palace of Herod because they have no interest in being involved with this evil plan that he is plotting to try and eliminate the king of the Jews. But when Herod realizes that the wise men, they're not coming back to the palace, they're not gonna tell him where in Bethlehem this child currently is residing, he says, okay, I'll just deal with this my way. And in Matthew chapter two, verse 16, we see one of the most, if not the most, shocking verses in all of the Christmas story. 
In fact, this is a verse that often doesn't show up in our reenactments of the Christmas story. This is a verse we often don't read under the Christmas tree because this is a verse of just barbaric ruthlessness. Genocide is what we see. Look at the way Herod responds. Matthew 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. This is hard to comprehend. Imagine the horror of this. That all the baby boys ages two and under for an entire area, an entire region, they are eliminated at the pleasure of King Herod because he feels threatened and doesn't want there to be any opportunity for someone to grow up and attempt to overthrow his throne. It's a horrible scene to imagine. A horrible thing to consider the genocide that Herod enacts because he feels threatened in his power. And here's where I'm going to ask you to just stop for a second and just examine in your own life and your own story. This is tough here. Herod actually shows us a picture, a snapshot, a glimpse of the human heart when the human heart is fighting for power, seeking to hold power, and that power is threatened. It's a brutal view that we see. It's a barbaric example that we see. But Herod is actually giving us a glimpse into the the wickedness, if you will, the depravity, if you will, of the human heart when the human heart senses that the power that we think we possess or the control that we think we have begins to be threatened. And when our power or our control begins to be threatened, we, we lash out to attack that thing, that person that might threaten our power and control and self-proclaimed authority. You see, here's the point. And this is a hard message at Christmas, but an incredibly important message at Christmas. Jesus is a threat to our kingdoms. Jesus is a threat to whatever kingdom you or I are trying to build around ourselves. Jesus is a threat to those who don't wanna surrender control of their lives, to those who don't wanna be told what to do, to those who don't wanna be under the authority of another, to those who want to be king, Jesus is a threat. And we are reminded at Christmas every year, this very sobering truth that we can't fight to be king and worship the king of kings at the same time. You just can't do it. You can't fight to be king and worship the king of kings, the true king, at the same time. Jesus makes this clear. It shows up throughout his ministry and different things that he says and different things that he does. One of the the most stark examples of this is in the Sermon on the Mount. We spent a lot of time in the Sermon on the Mount this year, but but Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, no one can serve two masters. You can't do it. You can't fight to be king 
and worship the king of kings at the same time. Either you will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. And then Jesus gives us an example of how this often plays out. One of the idols that is worshiped in our culture over and over again is the idol of money, the things that we want to possess, the material goods of this world. And Jesus says, you cannot serve God in money. No one can serve two masters. If you are attempting to be king, if you are attempting to hold on to power and authority and control in your own life and be lord of the manor in your own story, you will not be able to worship the king of kings and the king of kings will feel like a threat to you. But I realize you may think, okay, well, Herod is an extreme example, and you know we might have some stuff going on in our life and our heart, but none of us are as bad as Herod. I mean, the guy brings about a genocide. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, that's a little extreme to, to have a, a barbaric example like Herod and think that's somehow connected to our hearts. But, but, but if that's what you feel, let's go back to the story for just a second, and let's see who else is involved in this story with Herod. Because this might bring it a little closer to home for all of us here in the church when we see the way the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees actually participate in Herod's plan. Matthew chapter two, verses four and five, it says this, Herod is, who's just, been threatened, right? In verse three, he feels troubled and all of Jerusalem feels troubled with him. Verse four, it says, so he assembles all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. This, these are the Jewish religious leaders. These are the experts on the law, the experts on the word of God. And Herod required, inquired of them where the Christ was born. Hey guys, can y'all help me out? I'm trying to figure out this threat to my authority and my kingdom, and I need somebody who's an expert on the word to come and help me out. And so they told him, verse five, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And here's what is so striking to me about these verses. These religious leaders who knew the prophecy of of the prophet Micah that that prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, these these religious leaders who knew the word of God and, and, and should have been longing with expectation for the Messiah to come, they join in to Herod's plan to find this threat so that it can be eradicated because they are completely unmoved by what they know of God's word. They are completely unmoved by what they know of God's word. They're completely unchanged by all that they've studied and all that they've heard and all that they've learned of God's word. And I want you to know, when I read that here at Christmas, It magnifies for me as as a pastor a burden that I feel every year this time of year knowing that there will be many people who will come and join us for a Christmas service of some kind. Praise God that 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 they will come, that are not typically in church, that are not typically involved in in the the life of the faith community, but, but they're CEOs, right? They show up Christmas, Easter only, and hey, we're glad you come. Come on, we want you here. But when they come, they hear a story that's familiar. They hear a story perhaps that they've heard many times before. And many times they leave out of Christmas and a Christmas service. And they're just completely unchanged and unmoved by everything that they've heard and seen and known that felt familiar. It's just another tradition. It's just another thing to do during the Christmas season. And their lives are completely unchanged. As I was studying this week, I came across this 
little quote from one of the commentaries that I often use, the Christ-centered exposition commentary. I want to just share this with you because this is what we're seeing play out here in Matthew chapter two. It says that when Herod inquired of these Jewish religious leaders as to where the Messiah was to be born, they quoted from the Old Testament revealing that he would be born in Bethlehem. And what is so startling is that these men who knew the Messiah's birthplace did absolutely nothing about it. It is a dangerous thing to know the word and fail to respond. I want to say that again. It is a dangerous thing to know the word and fail to respond. These religious leaders were indifferent to Jesus And this indifference and apathy soon developed into outright opposition. Church, please listen. Please do not let another Christmas season pass you by as you just go through the motions and are unmoved and unchanged by what the Christmas story truly means. It is possible to hear the good news of Christmas year after year after year and be completely unmoved and completely unchanged by what the word of God is revealing. Church, Please, I beg of you, invite the Spirit of God to show you and me what we need to see at this Christmas season in this specific year. Lord, show us. Don't let this be old news. Don't let this be routine. Don't let this be going through the motions. God, come and breathe life into our lungs. Let us see what we need to see at Christmas for this good news must change us. This good news is too good to leave us the same. Oh, how we need to hear what the word of God is laying before us. How quickly we can become numb to the word of truth. It is fascinating to me, and we'll close with this this morning, to see The next time the term king of the Jews is used in Matthew's gospel, after this place right here in Matthew 2, when the wise men show up in Herod's palace, they say, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? You know where it appears the next time in Matthew's gospel? It's Matthew chapter 27. Do you know what's happening in Matthew chapter 27? This is when Jesus is is beaten and mocked and tortured and has a crown of thorns thrust up on his head as he is taken away to be crucified. The scripture says it this way, verse 28 and 29 of Matthew 27, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then when Jesus is hung on the cross and is being crucified for the sins of the world, for your sins and for mine, when the king of kings gives up his life so that you and I might live. Do you know there's a sign at the cross that they they put there to mock Jesus? Matthew 27 shows us over the head of Jesus, they put the charge against him. Do you know what the charge against Jesus was? This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. The king of kings and the Lord of lords that is a threat to anyone who desires to be king lays down his life 
gives up his life for you and for me at the cross, the suffering servant, so that you and I might be invited to this beautiful invitation of hope that comes through Jesus Christ alone. And so the question for you and for me at Christmas is what kingdom are we bowing before? What king are we serving with our lives? What might the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords be inviting you and me today to lay down with open hands saying, you are the king. You are what I need. You are my hope. Christmas provides this intersection where we stop and consider the implications of what has taken place. And we must evaluate, if we are honest, in the Christmas story, what it means that the King of Kings has come. You cannot fight to be king and worship the King of Kings at the same time. And so the question becomes, will we view the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as a threat, or will we, like the wise man, come searching for hope, longing for hope, and receiving the hope that we so desperately need by surrendering and trusting and following the King of the Jews? the King of kings and the Lord of lords who laid down his life so that you and I might truly live. What king do you serve? As we consider these questions here this morning, let me pray for us, include our time in God's word. We're gonna pick up this story again next week and revisit the wise men. But for now, let's just invite the spirit of God to continue to work in us as we go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is a challenging Christmas message. But the reality is, for many people, the truth of Christmas and what Jesus Christ has done, it is a threat. Because we wanna be in control We want to be king many times. And we want to hold on to these things that we feel like we possess. And we don't, we don't, want, to, we don't want anyone to mess with our power or our authority. And yet, here we see that the true king has come. And so, Lord, I just pray that in, that, in our hearts, in our minds, as we may even be wrestling right now, Lord, would you give us the faith to simply open our hands and say, King Jesus, you are what I need. King Jesus, I trust you. King Jesus, I will follow you. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son to, to give up his life so that we might live, so that we might be invited into your kingdom, a, a, a kingdom that, that is at work here in this world, but a kingdom, the only kingdom that will last far beyond this world, the kingdom of eternity, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of our God. Lord, thank you for the invitation to be a part of your kingdom. Give us the faith to trust you. Give us the faith to follow you. King Jesus, you are Lord and we need you. So we invite you to continue to stir in our hearts. Continue to pursue us with your love. We need you. And we pray for the faith to follow and trust you as you lead. Thank you for this time together and the gift of Christmas this year. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Church, let's stand, let's sing together, and let's celebrate what we've seen and what we've heard and the good news of Christmas that hope truly is available to anyone and everyone who is searching for hope. His name is Jesus, and we come before him.